Well, I'd like to begin by offering a word of thanks on behalf of all of us to Darren Davis for all he has done. Darren's a very valuable member of our department and we certainly appreciate all he does for the Institute and for Baylor. So it is a very great honor for me to have the privilege of introducing John Haldane, but it's also a rather daunting task. John Haldane is, of course, professor of philosophy at the University of St. Andrews and director of the Center for Ethics, Philosophy, and Public Affairs there. However, adequately to, des to describe his accomplishments would take way more of his time than he would want or you would want. John has made significant contributions to virtually every subfield of philosophy, including aesthetics, philosophy of education, ethics, both theoretical and applied, the history of philosophy, particularly medieval and early modern philosophy, and he has done extremely valuable work in contemporary epistemology, metaphysics, philosophy of religion, not to mention political and social philosophy. I'm not sure he, why he hasn't gotten around to working into a book on, say, the philosophy of physics or uh, something like that, but I'm sure he'll get to it eventually. John's articles number nearly 200, and I actually just lost count of how many books he's authored or edited. I kept getting different numbers every time I, and I finally gave up. It's hard to know which of these books to mention, but I'll sample just a few. Reality, Representation, and Projection, co-edited with Crispin Wright. Seeking Meaning and Making Sense, Atheism and Theism, co-authored with J.J.C. Smart, and an, an Intelligent Person's Guide to Religion. This small sample gives you some sense of the variety of his work as well as the depth of that work. Now in looking at this long list of articles and books, one would be tempted to think that John Haldane must actually be a pseudonym for a group of philosophers. <laughs> since it's hard to believe that one individual could do work that is so accomplished in so many vastly different areas. There are few people who can write on esoteric issues in contemporary metaphysics and epistemology while at the same time doing first-rate work on Thomas Aquinas and Thomas Reed. There are even fewer that can do first-rate philosophical work at the highest level while addressing issues for the general public dealing with the environment, political justice, education, the state of the church. But this is exactly what John Haldane has achieved. He is a public intellectual in the finest sense of that word. Someone equally at home in the most rarefied reaches of the academy and on the BBC where his voice is often heard. Speaking in a more personal vein, John is also a deeply Christian man whose faith shapes not just his work but his life. He's deeply committed to the church. He has spent time helping victims of crime, volunteering to serve those with mental disorders. He's worked to provide the insights of his philosophical work to psychologists and counselors. When my wife Jan and I spent a semester at St. Andrews just three years ago, John and his gracious wife Hilda simply went above and beyond what anyone might expect in extending their hospitality and making us welcome, having us in their home again and again. It's wonderful to welcome him here to Baylor to present the William Carey Crane Scholars Lecture on The Wise and the Otherwise. Well, thank you, thank you for that uh, very gracious uh, introduction. Um, I suppose it's, I now know what my obituary might sound a little bit like, so thank you for that. <laughs> The, uh, I, in fact, I had to, um, in the course of uh, the afternoon, make a decision really about whether I was going to speak very briefly and in a sort of, uh, in the style of an after dinner, a few comments, or more substantially. Um, in fact, I've decided to do both. Uh, that's to say, I'm going to, um, I want to, I, I felt it would be a pity not to take the opportunity to engage uh, uh, some matters of substance and reflect a little bit on them with you. But uh, I also want to pick up some of the themes of the, uh, of the conference uh, particularly and uh, say a few words about those um, also. Uh, but let me begin, if I may, with uh, words of appreciation and of celebration. 
Um, we've already heard that when this idea was conceived, there was some local skepticism as to whether or not it could be realized. <laughs> but it is a wonderful idea, and the having of it is already something that uh, uh, should be uh, acknowledged and celebrated. But the implementation of it seems to me to be quite astounding. Uh, it's been remarkable how many people have come from so many uh, different uh, locations and backgrounds and approached topics and issues in such a variety of interesting uh, ways. It really has been very effectively and graciously realized, this whole conception of this conference. And for that, we, uh, we give thanks. I mean, thanks have already been given, but let me just repeat, if I may, uh, so far as those who were involved in the conception and organization of this, certainly Darren once again, and also, I won't go through the na other names, but I did want to mention particularly Vicky Schultz again. Thank you for the very warm and helpful way in which you've attended to matters. So thank you both again. It's been a particular pleasure for me to uh, visit Baylor. This is, in fact, not the first time I visited Baylor. I was here some years ago to give a lecture. But um, given the developing relationship, some mention has been made of that just now, between uh, Baylor and uh, St. Andrews, and this owes much to Michael Beatty, uh, the chairman of the philosophy department here, who um, came over and we talked about things and so on. And now the result of that is that Baylor brings a group of students, as many of you will know, um, to St. Andrews, and I think that's going to increase the uh, frequency of that and the number of those students. We've already had a number of Baylor faculty, um, including um, Michael and others, uh, and uh, it's been for us really quite enriching. And so we're grateful for that, and we look forward to, to seeing more of you join us. Um, I think the, uh, in reflecting uh, on this conference, I uh, was looking at how many talks I think that I'd been present at, and the, the answer was 25. Um, and then looking at the, uh, so the scale of the conference is very impressive, but in a way you could assemble a very large number of people, but just get endless repetition. In fact, that hasn't been the case at all. One of the most remarkable things about this conference is the extent to which people have come to discuss uh, a common theme and yet have brought quite distinctive contributions to that, even where they've been discussing the same texts in some cases and the same figures uh, in others. Um, those figures have ranged from those of antiquity, uh, Plato, Aristotle, Isocrates, Cicero, going through Plotinus, Augustine, uh, St. Bened uh, Benedict, uh, through to the High Middle Ages, Aquinas and so on, all the way through to Newman, Chesterton, Chesterton Wendell Berry and so on. Um, I calculated, I think, about uh, 20 or so recurrent, significantly recurrent names, and I think that that is in itself very interesting, the range of figures who have been uh, discussed. But let me just say again, by way of appreciation uh, and congratulation, I think it has been a tremendous conference, a great tribute to Baylor, uh, but also a great tribute to all of those who have uh, contributed to it. And certainly from my point of view, this has been particularly enriching, um, the kind of conference that I couldn't hope to uh, see organized in Britain. And I may come back to say something about that uh, a little later on. But I said I wanted to engage some a matter of substance because it occurred to me that one thing that, uh, now I say I've been to 25, only 25 of the presentations, in the 25 that I attended, I think there was no mention of the issue uh, of evolution or issues uh, connected with evolution. And um, you might think, well, why would there be, uh, given the themes of the conference? And you might also think that given the um, problematic uh, character of that issue, um, the way it has been uh, the focus of uh, so much friction and attention in the past, that one would want to simply um, put it to one side, and to some extent I think it has been put to one side, so far, so far as concerns the fundamental question about the compatibility of evolution uh, and uh, belief in creation. But uh, there is an aspect of evolution and evolutionary theory that seems to me does press down upon Christians and religious believers, which is not to do with the question of creation, but to do with the question of explanation. Not explanation of the existence of the world, in general, but explanation of the character of human beings in particular. And so I want, if I may, with your indulgence, to uh, reflect for a little while, first of all, 
on this issue of evolution as it, as I say, is bearing down somewhat across the humanities, out of the sciences, but across the humanities, and seems to me to present one kind of threat uh, to the humanities as traditionally conceived of. So let me, um, first of all, address that. So viewed from the perspective of the 19th century, there's little in the details of contemporary political life that would seem special. Tensions between great powers Ethnic and religious divisions, trade rivalries, economic recessions, currency crises, civil unrest, and so on, are all part of the fabric of the modern world. Social life in the West has been marked by the dissolution of families and communities into voluntary and market associations of individuals. But while that was a distinctive feature of the 20th century and has extended into the 21st century, it's a continuation of trends well established in previous times, principally through industrialization and urbanization. The issues of pure and applied science are somewhat different. For whatever future advances may serve to diminish the achievements of the present age, it must be clear that the 20th century was one of remarkable and ever accelerating scientific and technological development, and that the range, extent, and forms of this development were largely unimaginable in the 19th century. Now, because of this, science has come to enjoy enormous prestige and to be widely viewed as the primary source of concepts and theories sufficient to describe and explain all of reality, including human beings. An older Baconian conception of science regarded it as the philosophically unassuming, or relatively unassuming, phenomena identifying, hypothesis formulating study of the material composition and causal structure of nature. But that has been replaced by a view of science as an effect queen of the philosophies, bearing down upon metaphysics and theology possibly to press them into new vital forms, but more likely to crush the life out of them. Witness in this connection the opening page of Stephen Hawking's recent book, The Grand Design, some of you will be aware of. Hawking writes as follows, human beings are a curious species. We wonder, we seek answers. How can we understand the world in which we find ourselves? How does the universe behave? What is the nature of reality? Traditionally, he continues, these are questions for philosophy, but philosophy is dead. <laughs> philosophy has not kept up, he continues, philosophy has not kept up with modern developments in science, particularly physics, and scientists have become the bearers of the torch of discovery in our quest for knowledge. So much Hawking's. Now, Hawking's concern here is with cosmological issues. But if we turn to questions about human nature and moral consciousness, it isn't hard to find prominent declarations that traditional philosophical approaches have failed and that the lead must now be taken by innovative sciences. The following short quotation comes from the introduction to Patricia Churchland's new book, uh, she's a figure well known at least to some of the philosophers here I suspect, her new book subtitled What Neuroscience Tells Us About Morality. What Neuroscience Tells Us About Morality. She writes, the phenomenon of moral values, hitherto so puzzling, is now less so. Not entirely clear, just less puzzling. By drawing on converging new data from neuroscience, evolutionary biology, experimental psychology and genetics, and given a philosophical framework consilient with these data, that's really putting philosophy in its place, we can now meaningfully approach the question of where values come from. So this is an instance of the now we are getting somewhere view. Um, if you want another example of this, a very marked example, a couple of us were talking about this the other Todd Buris and I and a couple of others were having lunch the other day and were talking about this. Derek Parfit, who's a very uh, prominent and prestigious um, moral philosopher, Parfit, 
Is it All Souls College Oxford? Some of you may know that um, All Souls is a college that has no students, and so if you're appointed as a fellow of All Souls College, you are effectively a researcher uh, for life. Some are fixed-term fellowships, but he's a life fellow of All Souls. And that's obviously a very uh, eminent and prestigious and privileged position. But in addition, um, it's a mark of the extent to which Parfit is internationally enjoys that kind of prestige, that he has positions at Rutgers um, and at NYU also visiting positions there. And um, Derek Parfit, in a book uh, published a couple of decades ago, I suppose now, Reasons and Persons, sets out there the idea that um, ethics is just beginning. And the reason it's just beginning is because everything that went under the title of ethics until relatively recently was religious. So now we're getting somewhere by sort of pushing that to one side. And in his most recent book, published just uh, probably about six weeks ago, on what matters, he returns to this theme that now, effectively, that we've cleared religion out of the way, we can hope for some progress in ethics. So this is a recurrent theme within contemporary philosophy, the now we are getting somewhere. And uh, in the case of uh, Patricia Churchland's approach to this, we're getting somewhere because we're going to uh, draw upon neuroscience, evolutionary biology, experimental psychology, and genetics. Uh, philosophy itself proved uh, impotent in the effort to try to engage these issues. So seen in these ways, our age is one of scientific thought, less in dialogue with than in judgment upon philosophical, ethical, and religious habits of mind. It should be clear, I think, that this presents a serious challenge to traditional humanism, and not just within philosophy, actually, within history, with the other uh, humane uh, study subjects and so on, literature and such like. It presents a, a challenge in the sense of a perspective that interprets significance and value from the point of, sorry, I mean, the, 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 that to which it presents a challenge is a traditional view that interprets significance and value from the point of view of phenomenologically or reflectively accessible human needs, interests, sensibilities, and practices. In other words, from the viewpoint of lived human experience. That was the traditional starting point. And it presents a challenge to that because it's going away from lived human experience into things like neuroscience, evolutionary biology, and so on. For much of the 20th century, the focus of humanistic concern regarding science was the potential of its applications to destroy human life through biochemical and nuclear warfare. More recently, however, the focus of attention has shifted somewhat from the pros and cons of instrumental technology to the potential for science to change the way we think about human beings, and indeed to change their very nature by chemical, genetic, and surgical interventions. Now, the, uh, I say this connects us with evolution because this, does, this is one of the fruits of the great Darwinian revolution. The first major scientific challenge to traditional ideas of human nature came in 1871 with the publication of Darwin's speculations in The Descent of Man. There he applied the evolutionary theory presented in The Origin of Species in 1859 applied that to the case of human beings. And on that basis was led to write that, I quote, the difference in mind between man and the higher animals, great as it is, certainly is one of degree and not of kind. Certainly is one of degree and not of kind. So it's a quantitative rather than a qualitative difference. Prior to this, the prevailing idea, which had originated in antiquity, with the pre-Socratics, and which constituted philosophical orthodoxy through the late Hellenic, medieval, Renaissance, and Enlightenment periods, was of a hierarchy of species, with Homo sapiens sapiens set apart from the rest of nature by its capacity for reason and for moral consciousness. Darwin himself observed that, I quote, it may be freely admitted that no animal is self-conscious, if by this term it is implied that it reflects on such points as whence it comes, or whither it will go, or what is life and death, and so forth. But, as indicated by his deliberate contrast between difference, uh, differences of degree and of kind, he thought that this was ultimately only a quantitative rather than a qualitative distinction. 
The possibility that our moral and spiritual consciousness and our rationality, along with our upright posture and sparsity of body hair, might be the result of natural selection resulting in descent with modification from apes, was deeply disturbing to the Victorians in due course, though various modes of accommodation between theology and evolution were arrived at, principally by religious parties reinterpreting their claims in terms that rendered them compatible with scientific explanations of the operations of nature. Some reflective readers, however, in his own time, saw the threat not only to theological anthropology, but to, to, to traditional humanist understandings, and pointed to particular areas that seemed to resist reduction or this kind of explanation. An anonymous reviewer of The Descent, writing in the Edinburgh Review in 1871, pressed a charge that's still worthy of consideration, I think. That author, I don't know who it is, I've made efforts to find out, but I don't know who it is, writes as follows. Mr. Darwin's theory of the growth of the moral sense and of the intellectual faculty is unsupported by any proof. And the very cornerstone of the hypothesis, that the human mind is identical in kind with that of the brutes, is a mere assumption opposed alike to experience and to philosophy. Man's intellect and moral sense are now, as they ever were, inscrutable from the point of view offered by natural history and only to be comprehended from the higher consideration to which, as a mere naturalist, Mr. Darwin has not attained. Well, that last bit is perhaps a little bit of a rhetorical excess, but let us just say uh, <laughs> not attainable from a naturalistic perspective. Conscious moral consciousness, moral deliberation, human consciousness, not accessible from a naturalistic perspective. I'll return briefly to that point, but before doing so, I want to consider now a general argument for scientific reductionism implied by a famous remark of a major 20th century disciple of Darwin. The author in question is the Russian geneticist Dobzhansky, and the saying oft cited by evolutionary biologists is that, some of you will be familiar with this, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. Nothing in biology makes sense save in the light of evolution. This bold dictum formed the title of an article Dobzhansky published in 1973 in the American Biology Teacher. There he challenged biblical creationism, opposing it with the idea of a process that began some 10 billion years ago and is still underway. Interestingly, however, he also claimed that far from evolution being incompatible with divine creation, it is its method. This is a fairly familiar thought of reconciliation now. He didn't, however, venture the further thought to which an advocate of theistic arguments uh, might uh, move, might be attracted, namely that evolution only or best makes sense in the light of purposeful design. Quite why he didn't do that isn't altogether clear. Certainly he wasn't ignorant of such arguments um, or indeed of a broader theological speculation. He'd been raised Russian Orthodox and indeed even described himself as religious. Indeed, these biographical facts are sometimes merged to suggest that he was a traditional theist, as, for example, by Stephen Jay Gould, who, in an article entitled Darwinism Defined, described Dobzhansky as, I quote, the greatest evolutionist of our time and a lifelong Russian Orthodox. Now, in fact, however, Dobzhansky didn't believe in a personal god, or indeed in any transcendent creative source outside of nature. Rather, he seems to have identified creation with evolution itself. Immediately prior to the sentence I quoted earlier, he writes, I'm a creationist and an evolutionist. Evolution is God or nature's method of creation. The God or nature there is significant. This is, we heard, was it last night? I don't know, it's all going into a single blur now. Was it that Thomas Aquinas had spinozistic tendencies? Was that last night? I can't remember. Yes, at any rate. Uh, well, this is, uh, and of course, um, uh, Spinoza's great expression, God or nature. Um, evolution is God or nature's method of creation. And he ends his article, Zobzanski, by commending Théard de Chardin's immanentism, uh, citing a familiar passage from the phenomenon of man, 
where Teilhard de Chardin writes, evolution is a general postulate to which all theories, all hypotheses, all systems must henceforth bow and, to which, they must, and which they must satisfy in order to be thinkable and true. Evolution is a light which illuminates all facts. I just want to sort of emphasize this. The question that I'm going to be concerned with is not whether or not evolution is true. The question is about the explanatory power of evolution. So I'm just going to say this again. This is Théard de Chardin. Evolution is a general postulate to which all theories, all hypotheses, all systems must henceforth bow and which they must satisfy in order to be thinkable and true. Evolution is a light which illuminates all facts, a trajectory which all lines of thought must follow. This is what evolution is. So the overall impression here is of a kind of Spinozistic, um, Hegelian, spiritualized evolutionism with man, humankind, representing the emergence of self-awareness. Not only did Dobzhansky favor evolutionary theory as the best account of observed biological diversity and unity, he regarded it, and this is the important bit, as, a fully, compre as fully comprehensive in scope and in explanatory role. As he wrote elsewhere in another, uh, another article, he writes, evolution comprises all the stages of the development of the universe, the cosmic, biological, and human or cultural developments. Attempts to restrict the concept of evolution to biology are gratuitous. Life is a product of the evolution of inorganic nature, and man is a product of the evolution of life. So ends the quote. Now, these remarks of Teilhard de Chardin and of Dobzhansky license a stepwise, what I'm now going to call a stepwise extension of Dobzhansky's original aphorism. And this is the stepwise extension. Nothing in religion makes sense except in the light of psychology. Nothing in psychology makes sense save in the light of biology. Nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. Now, even assuming for, a mo for the moment the truth of the individual clauses there, nothing in religion makes sense except in the light of psychology, One, nothing in psychology makes sense save in the light of biology, and so on. Even assuming for the moment the truth of each of those individual clauses, it's not at all clear that one can simply conclude from their conjunction that nothing in religion makes sense save in the light of evolution. Explanation is not in general, sorry, I know it's late at night for this, but nonetheless, a logically transitive relation. What get explained and what explain are features or aspects, and these may differ from one step, or, uh, one step to another or one level to another. So, for example, that nothing in me, this is, you have to imagine this is a slightly, not, not heavily in this context, I immediately go on to say, but a slightly erotically charged situation here, that nothing in Mary's behavior, let us say her blushing, made sense save in the light of John's presence. Let's say Mary is blushing at John's presence, she's attracted to John and so on. Suppose also that nothing in David's behavior, sweating, made sense save in the light of Mary's presence. These don't jointly imply that nothing in David's behavior <laughs> made sense save in the light of John's presence. <laughs> what does the, that's an illustration of the failure of the transitivity of the uh, in sense of making sense of relation. What does the explaining in each case may be restricted to that case? Mary's infatuation with John and David's feeling for Mary. One might say that John's presence was per accidents a cause of David's sweating, but it's certainly not a per se explanation of it. Furthermore, there are contextual assumptions about background facts that form part of the explanation and not of what is to be explained, and these assumptions may vary in several dimensions, reflecting various human interests, meanings, and values. Making sense in the light of is an incomplete expression, and relevant specifications drawing upon features of religion, morality, psychology, biology, and evolutionary theory may yield no overall explanatory relation between level-specific features of religion and of evolution, respectively. Put somewhat less abstractly, even were it the case that moral experience or religious practice only made sense when seen psychologically as a form of social bonding, for example, 
and that social bonding only made sense when seen biologically in terms of common species membership, and that that in turn only made sense when seen in terms of evolutionary history, it simply wouldn't follow that the theory of speciation by natural selection makes sense of moral experience and religious practices, <coughs> let alone that the only sense that makes the only sense there is to be made of them. In order for that to be so, the features in question would have to be of the same sort and appropriately linked. And to presume that would amount to a strong and unwarranted form of reductionism, and indeed an absurd one. Just to press home this point, consider additional clauses to the effect that speciation by natural selection only makes sense in the light of genetics, that in light of that, genetics in light of biochemistry, and that in light of physics. Anyone who's inclined to think that it follows, therefore, that nothing in morality or religion makes sense save in the light of physics needs to revisit the idea of making sense. <laughs> so what then of the truth of the individual clauses? I just up to this point said even if they were true, it wouldn't follow that you could draw the conclusion. But what about the truth of the individual clauses? Well, Dobzhansky's main claim was that two marked features of life on Earth cannot be made sense of save in the light of evolutionary theory. First, biological diversity, amounting to several million species varying in size, structure, behavior, and habitat. And second, biological relatedness, as evidenced by widespread biological similarities at the level of anatomy and embryology, and the universal encoding of heredity at the biochemical level. Now, of themselves, these two features, biological diversity and relatedness, are compatible with a variety of explanations. But let me follow Dobzhansky and accept as their best explanation the assumption of common ancestry and then diversification through variation, heritability, and natural selection. What of the further claim that natural evolution comprises human and cultural developments, including ethics and religion? Remember, that was part of the claim. It, doesn't, it isn't just restricted to the level of biology. Now, here I want to as it were, switch a little to um, in a, a kind of an ecclesial source, if you like. The particular source is one that I know it is not necessarily widely shared in this room, but nonetheless it has some historical interest. I'm going to quote to you from the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, probably not your regular reading, but at any rate. In an address to the Pontifical Academy of Sciences in 1996 entitled On Evolution, Pope John Paul II reiter reiterated the position affirmed by Pope Pius XII in his 1950 encyclical Humanae Generis that, I quote, there is no conflict between evolution and the doctrine of faith. And he went further. John Paul II, in acknowledging the explanatory power of evolutionary science to the extent of saying, I quote, the theory of evolution is more than a hypothesis. Now, the positions of the two popes, uh, by the way, I'm drawing here on popes just because these have a kind of, at least for large numbers of people, a certain kind of authority that it would be hard to find a corresponding office that would you know, govern the, um, or stand in that relation. Uh, to other faiths or denominations, but there are, have been statements from other faiths and denominations on these matters, though not that many of them. The positions of the two popes is discussed in some detail in Stephen Jay Gould, by Stephen Jay Gould in one of the last books he published. It's a book that some of you might know. It's called Rocks of Ages, Science and Religion in the Fullness of Life. Now, the main theme of uh, Stephen Jay Gould's presentation uh, the main theme of the book is the presentation and defense of the idea of what he calls non-overlapping magisteria. Noma, non-overlapping magisteria. According to which science is seen as explaining the material structure of the world, while religion addresses the subject of its possible meaning. That's the way in which these matters are introduced and understood, proposed by Gould at any rate. Gould explains that he'd originally assumed that John Paul's statement was, as he writes, fully consistent with long-standing Roman Catholic support for Noma. But on reading the earlier encyclical of Pius XII, he came to see that there is a significant difference between the two papal documents and the attitudes that animate them. He writes, 
Stephen Jay Gould writes, Pius had grudgingly admitted evolution as a legitimate hypothesis that he regarded as only tentatively supported and potentially, as he clearly hoped, untrue. John Paul, nearly 50 years later, reaffirms the legitimacy of evolution under the NOMA principle, but then adds that additional data and theory have placed the factuality of evolution beyond reasonable doubt. That's Stephen Jay Gould. Now, the spread of knowledge has made us less innocent than Darwin's contemporaries, and our degree of intellectual pluralism and diversification means that we're used to compartmentalizing ideas and values. Nonetheless, like the author, the anonymous author of the Edinburgh Review in 1871, we too, I think, should feel challenged by current scientific inquiry into aspects of human nature and be aware that the reconciliation Gould recommends may not always be possible. In fact, I don't believe the Noma thesis. I think it's just not true that religion and science are non-overlapping magisteria. I think it's... I think that, um, for the most part, of course, scientists have no interest whatsoever in religion, but religious people do have an interest in not being embarrassed uh, in the presence of scientists. And so the Noma thesis has been very attractive, the idea that, you know, science just deals with the matter of the world, religion deals with the meaning, so there's no competition. I don't think things are as simple as that, but, um, and one way in which that lack of simplicity shows itself are in the ambitions uh, touched on by Dobzhansky, the ambitions uh, of evolutionary theory to provide a total explanation. Nothing of what I'm saying is meant to be a contest against the fundamentals of evolution. What I'm talking interested in is the sufficiency of evolutionary explanations of certain matters. Now, most theists are committed to the belief, first of all, that the universe is a work of creation. Secondly, that its course is under divine governance. And thirdly, that human beings are images of God in the respect of having a spiritual aspect to their nature. I mean, if you don't, I was going to call that minimal theism, right? I mean, that the, the, the uh, universe is a work of creation, that its course is under divine governance, and that human beings are images of God, at any rate of the Abrahamic <coughs> theism. Thus, they're restricted, it seems to me, in what they can consistently believe about human origins and nature. While Pius XII and John Paul II were correct in saying that Christian doctrine is not in conflict with the general outlook of natural evolution, this, together with the latter's acceptance of evolution as a fact, risks, I think, creating a false sense of general compatibility. For belief in creation, providence, and spiritual nature is at odds with the developed positions advanced by many of the intellectual descendants of Darwin. Pius XII had distinguished between the doctrine of evolution in as far as it, require, as it inquires into the origins of the human body as coming from pre-existent and living matter, distinguished between that and a general evolutionary account of all aspects of human nature and rejected the latter as incompatible with Christian teaching. And John Paul II, whom Stephen Jay Gould regards as having, as it were, departed from that position, writes that, Theories of evolution, I quote, which, because of the philosophies which inspire them, regard the spirit either as emerging from the forces of living matter or as a simple epiphenomenon of that matter, are incompatible with the truth about man. They are therefore unable to serve as the basis for the dignity of the human person. While species have evolved and the range of life forms existing today and in the past is the result of variation and of natural selection, it doesn't follow that the development of consciousness and the appearance of thinking, deliberating beings are the product of purely physical processes leading to chance variations in replication. The latter reductionism not only goes beyond the empirical evidence, but also includes claims about all processes being physical and the course of biological evolution being due to chance that could not be empirically confirmed since they're really philosophical theses presented under the guise of scientific ones. The issue of the historical emergence of mind is a philosophical one, and in part a theological one, in just the same way as is the issue of the relationship between mental and physical properties. Indeed, it is virtually the same issue 
seen in diachronic horizontal perspective rather than from a sort of synchronic vertical standpoint. What I mean is, if you ask the question, what is the relationship in me now or in any of you now between your mental properties and your physical properties, lie that question on its side, and that is the question about what's the relationship now between the existence of mental properties in the universe and the existence of only physical properties, if that's the assumption, at some early stage. Religious believers should not be intimidated, I think, by the assertion that science has shown that we are products of blind chance and entirely physical causes. And uh, personalists, I'm using that as a sort of general term for people who believe in the, or the irreducibility of the human person, should resist the idea that human minds differ from other parts of nature only in the complexity of their physical processes. But each should also, I think, set out to challenge the scientific assumption wherever it's made and expose its difficulties. Now, um, for reasons of time, I'm not going to develop that line further, though I would just say this, that currently the main focus of resistance among philosophers, for example, who choose to be resistant or want to be resistant to, say, physicalist explanations or fully um, materialist explanations, the current focus of their attention is on consciousness, in particular what's sometimes called phenomenal consciousness, the what it's like. For my own part, and somewhat sort of um, eccentrically, I actually don't think that consciousness is a particular problem for physicalism. I think the really deep problem for physicalism is the thing that most people think isn't the problem for physicalism, which is intellection, the capacity of human beings uh, to engage in certain kinds of logically structured, rational um, uh, inquiry. Now, I'd, I'd like to develop, uh, develop those matters further now, but I'm not going to for reasons of, of time. But I want to set that as the background by way of a sort of general illustration of the fact that there really are issues pressing down upon those who would see education and the subjects that constitute a higher education within particularly the humanities, uh, who would see those as oriented toward in the direction of, say, moral um, and spiritual values. There are pressures bearing down upon them from, uh, say, the developments of evolutionary theory, or let us say the absorption of broader or the expansion of broader into broader contexts of the fundamental elements of evolutionary theory. And that, as I said, that argument that says, you know, X is only explicable in terms of Y and so on, is the principal mode of argumentation. And what I've tried to show just briefly tonight is that, in fact, it rests on the fallacious assumption of the transitivity of the explanation relation. But I also think the individual clauses uh, are, are, are often false. And this is, is well, one task that particularly the philosophically minded like, might like to engage in over the next few years is sort of exploring the ways in which this can be challenged and this mode of explanation should be challenged. But I want now to turn uh, from what would then be the details of that uh, back to uh, the theme, the, the, the general theme of the conference. Um, while it may seem natural to members of Baylor University and to other colleges uh, and universities represented here, while it may seem natural to them that it should be home to something called an institute of faith and learning, I have to remind you that viewed from the perspective of the dominant culture of Western institutions of higher education, this is something rare and even scandalous. <laughs> Faith is, for many academics, eminent and otherwise, a term akin to superstition or credulity. This title, the wise and the otherwise, that was given to these remarks, um, I take from John Stuart Mill. Actually, Mill is one of the few figures who hasn't got, been discussed, I think, in the course of this. But anyway. Uh, that's probably because he's thought to be a baddie, but you're going to, it's going to turn out he's not, not so bad after all. But anyway, the, the, the phrase, the wise and the otherwise, uh, comes from John Stuart Mill. He had no doubt, by the way, which camp he was in, uh, and, nor, and nor the most academics. But the more revealing fact is that many, if not most, would put, most academics, would put people of faith into the camp of the otherwise. Not the wise, but the otherwise. Rather than being troubled by this, however, I think we may reasonably take this to be an indication of problems in the world of higher education. Problems is, in fact, a, a mild term, and others might be tempted to speak of crisis or corruption. In fact, I'm sure that in the course of these days, people have spoken about crisis and corruption. 
In the West, higher education has gone from being the privilege of the few to being an unassumed right of the many. In 1869, another figure who hasn't been discussed so far, but in 1869, the English writer Matthew Arnold, or I apologize if Matthew Arnold has been discussed, but that was one of the sessions I didn't get to. In 1869, the English writer Matthew Arnold published Culture and Anarchy. Very interesting to look at the proximity of all of these dates, by the way, Darwin, um, Matthew Arnold, and others. As well as being an important poet and social commentator, Arnold was also an inspector of schools and a professor at Oxford University. He saw education, properly speaking, that is to say in contrast to technical training, he saw education as being an essential means for the, tr tr an essential means for the transmission of high culture. Arnold wrote of how being introduced to such culture is, and I quote, coming to know the best that has been thought and said in the world. And he added the following, again I quote, the idea which culture sets before us of perfection, an increased spiritual activity, having for its characters increased sweetness, increased light, increased life, increased sympathy, this is an idea which the new democracy needs far more than the idea of the blessedness of the franchise or the wonderfulness of their own industrial performances. Now this is a noble idea with which Augustine, Aquinas, Newman and others who we've been discussing, uh, who also wrote on education, in the case of the authors I've just mentioned in the De Magistro, in the De Veritati and in the idea of a university, this trinity of authors, Augustine, Aquinas and Newman, it's an idea with which they would certainly have agreed, the Arnoldian idea. It's also one, however, that can only be effectively pursued through the kind of intensive education and formation that involves a relatively small number of students in each class, tutored by a widely read and committed teacher. This combination is impossible in a mass higher education system, simply impossible. And the possibility of continuing to fund such a system, even with lower educational ambitions, is certainly proving too much for the states of Western Europe. My own university, St. Andrews, is the third oldest university in the English-speaking world. Currently, it's celebrating its 600th anniversary. It is like Bologna, Oxford, Salamanca, Paris, Cambridge, Padua, Coimbra, La Sapienza and Rome, Pisa, Louvain, and a dozen other still existing institutions, a creation of the medieval world. And like these, and like many other esta others established since, it is a creation of Christian culture. Now, John Stuart Mill is best known, along with Jeremy Bentham, as one of the founders of utilitarianism and of modern liberalism. But two years before Matthew Arnold's publication of Cultural, Culture and Anarchy, Mill reflected on education and delivered a long address on the subject of it at St. Andrews when he was elected rector there in 1867. It's an office elected, elected by the students. In fact, there's just been an election in the days that I've been here and some rather prominent figure, Lord Forsyth, Loth came in sixth place, which is quite nice. The students are quite willing just to elect, uh, you know, relative unknowns in the face of grandees. At any rate, uh, uh, John Stuart Mill's address uh, lasted for three hours. <laughs> you, and I warn you that I will only last for two and a half hours. Now, his, his speech lasted for three hours, which says much, I think, about Mill and about the students and about the cultural standards of the time. What he said on that occasion connects with his observation that I've quoted that some are wise and some are otherwise. Being other than wise can be due to natural limitations of intelligence, but also to lack of proper education. And Mill thought that one of the main purposes of a university was to cultivate wisdom in those who were capable of it. This requires appropriate virtues on the part of both student and teacher, not just intellectual virtues, and a proper curriculum and syllabi structured around what Arnold characterized as the best 
that had been thought and said. The best, the, not the latest that's been thought and said, but the best that's been thought and said. It's significant, I believe, that this understanding of the primary role of the universities was most profoundly expressed in two texts which both originated in public lectures. That is, lectures to the public, not just to academics namely Mill's rectorial address to the students at St Andrews and John Henry Newman's idea of a university delivered as lectures in Dublin and first published in 1852 with the later extended edition uh, six years later, a decade and a half earlier than Mill. And Mill had read uh, Newman. From the perspective of the present, the most striking features of these two accounts, the Millian and the Newmanian accounts of the nature and value of university education, is what they exclude. And since it's become increasingly the case that leading universities are associated precisely with the activities in question, I need to emphasize that, these, uh, that they are saying these are what are to be excluded from universities. Newman thought that it was not the business of universities to engage in research. He writes, a university is a place of teaching universal knowledge. This implies that its object is on the one hand intellectual, not moral, and on the other that it is the diffusion and extension of knowledge rather than the advancement of it. If its object were scientific and philosophical discovery, I do not see why a university should have students. If its object were scientific and philosophical discovery, I do not see why a university should have students. Of course, some research academics take <laughs> entirely share that view. They don't see that in any sense of reductio ad absurdum. That's fine, yeah, let's get rid of them. Uh, Newman was not against research. Let me emphasize this. Newman was not against research, but thought it should be conducted in special institutes. Mill likewise thought that the fact that certain activities are important for individuals and for society doesn't mean that they should be part of the university curriculum. Mill writes as follows, a university is not a place of professional education. Universities are not intended to teach the knowledge required to fit men, of course then it was men exclusively, to fit men for some special mode of gaining their livelihood. Their object is not to make skillful lawyers or physicians or engineers, but capable and cultivated human beings. It's very right that there should be public facilities for the study of professions, but these things are no part of what every generation owes to the next, as that on which its civilization and worth will principally depend. These are no part of that. Now, to understand these passages, it's necessary to remind ourselves of the distinction between knowledge and understanding, and between the promotion and enhancement of welfare and the cultivation of the human mind. Newman was concerned that, as well as coming to know about the particular and the temporary, human beings need to form an understanding of the general and the permanent. And to do that, he thought, they need to develop powers of abstraction and analogy so as to reunite at an intellectual level what has become diversified at a scientific or technical or practical one. And this is related to what I was saying in the earlier phase of things about the distinctive powers of human beings being intellectual powers. Now this, according to Newman, yields understanding which is both an enduring constituent of human flourishing and an aid in various forms of practical life. He writes, when the intellect and this is a familiar passage, when the intellect has once been properly trained and formed to have a connected view or grasp of things, it will display its power with more or less effect according to its particular quality and capacity in the individual. In the case of most, it makes itself felt in the good sense, sobriety of thought, reasonableness, candor, self-command, and steadfastness of view which characterize it. The Newman-Mill-Arnold view as indeed the Plato, Aristotle, Augustine, Aquinas view, and I might add now the Calvin, Buchanan, Knox idea of education, has implications for the present day. First, we need to distinguish within higher education between the business of cultivating minds towards wisdom and that of conducting research, and again of training people for specific forms of employment. Second, to specify more precisely 
And to implement that distinction in practice, one needs to confront the claim that university education is for the sake of economic benefit. Now, that idea that it's for the sake of some, for economic benefit is something that academics are generally very keen to dispute. Inst institutional managers, of course, rather less so. But to reject the idea that universities are for the sake of economic prosperity is not to exclude such benefit as an anticipated or even desirable secondary effect. You'll, perhaps some of you hear an echo there of the doctrine of double effect. Now next, and here academics I think are more likely to be somewhat divided, one needs, and I'm going to really want to emphasize this, one needs to challenge the idea, which is now quite current, that good teaching is impossible unless teachers are also researchers. I think this is simply false. This notion is open to objection on several scores. First, to keep abreast of one's subject requires scholarship, which is not the same as the pursuit and attainment of new knowledge, but may well take deeper learning and better judgment. Scholarship is often harder than research. Second, what's pursued under the heading of research, at any rate in the arts, humanities, and social sciences, is often of dubious worth, being merely the accumulation of knowledge, if that, without proper regard to the goal of integrated understanding. Third, the mass of research does not much benefit fellow researchers, since the more that's produced, the less relatively is consumed. The expansion in the number and size of universities over the last 30 years, along with the development of the culture of research, has massively increased book and journal publication. And research productivity has been further increased by electronic publication. A recent survey estimated that over one million academic articles are published each year. One million academic articles are published each year in some 28,000 journals of which 20,000 are peer-reviewed. The average reported reading time for an article, and articles, by the way, on average have grown longer, the average reported reading time has decreased from 48 minutes per reading to 30 minutes. Fourth, and in general terms, the more academics have the opportunity for research, the less they may wish to teach, in particular to teach undergraduates and particularly undergraduates at the earliest stages of their studies, as contrasted with enlisting graduate students in their own expanding research projects. To put the matter somewhat more boldly, and I'm drawing to a conclusion you'll be relieved to know, the growing mass of researchers may have become a drag on and even an obstacle to the, primary, uh, to the pursuit of the primary purpose of universities. I'm going to say that again. The, the growing mass of researchers may have become a drag upon and even an obstacle to the pursuit of the primary purpose of universities, namely education. It impedes the effort to put students first and it consumes vast sums of private and public funding. How individuals and corporations choose to spend their resources is up to them, but how the state chooses to do so is up to citizens. There's an interesting short story some of you will be familiar with by G.D. Salinger entitled Franny, in which the main character after whom the story is named is visiting an elite US university, it's evidently Princeton, from her own smaller women's college, it's evidently Smith College, Massachusetts. Franny carries with her a copy of the Russian work The Way of a Pilgrim. This is a relatively well-known uh, work in the Orthodox tradition of spiritual writing in which the narrator travels across Russia in search of spiritual fulfillment. Through Franny, the, through the character of Franny, we're invited to reflect upon the contrast between that search for wisdom upon which she is engaged and the sapiential shallowness or absence she encounters at the heart of advanced higher education, as here represented by Princeton. She reflects as follows. I don't, think it would have all, I don't think it would have all got me quite so down if just once in a while, just once in a while, there was at least some polite little perfunctory implication that knowledge should lead to wisdom, and that if it doesn't, it's just a disgusting waste of time. But there never is. You never even hear any hints dropped on a campus that wisdom is supposed to be the goal of knowledge. You hardly ever hear the word wisdom mentioned. 
In almost four years of college, and this is the absolute truth, in almost four years of college, the only time I can remember ever even hearing the expression wise man being used was in my freshman year in political science. And do you know how it was used? It was used in reference to some nice old poopy elder statesman who'd made a fortune in the stock market and gone to Washington to be an advisor to President Roosevelt. Honestly now, four years of college almost, and I'm not saying that happens to everybody, but I just, but I just get so upset when I think about it, I could die, she writes. Well, it's particularly sobering to note that Salinger's story was first published in the New Yorker magazine in 1955 which tells us that Franny's experience was not uncommon even then, and suggests one major source of the lead away from an understanding of universities as places for the cultivation of minds towards an idea of them as instruments of economic advantage or as places of research. As the situation in the public finances worsens, and it is worsening, hard choices will have to be made. It's hardly plausible to insist that education should continue to enjoy levels of support without obvious benefit to the undergraduates for whose sake the universities were brought into being and who increasingly will have to pay for them. The theologians tell us that God does not will the evil but permits it for the sake of the, but permits it for the sake of the good that may come from it. Viewed in that perspective, the financial crises besetting Western countries due to personal and public debt and the resulting fiscal contractions may yet bring forth benefits for the university if they cause us now to engage in an overdue conversation about the value, aims and purposes of education. Finally, if the, universe is to, if the university is to fulfill, whatever the universe has to fulfill its role, if the university is to fulfill its role as a place for society to engage in reflection and self-criticism, then it needs to set aside the absurd posturing of those who would outdo one another in the extravagance of their claims. An example of this from the English-speaking world is the lecture by Richard Rorty entitled An Ethics for Today, published posthumously. Setting himself squarely against the Catholic Church and its tradition of moral objectivism rooted in a philosophical and theological anthropology, Rorty asks and answers a question. I mean, here he's made his target Catholicism, but it could be any other Orthodox Christian denomination. Is the Church right that there's such a thing as the structure of human existence which can serve as a moral reference point? Or do we humans have no moral obligations except in helping one another satisfy our desires, thus achieving the greatest possible amount of happiness. He says, that was his question, there is nothing already in existence, this is his answer, there is nothing already in existence to which our moral ideals should try to correspond. The answer to the question, are some human desires bad, is no. But some desires do get in the way of our project of maximizing the overall satisfaction of desires. There is no such thing, writes Rorty, as an intrinsically evil desire. There is no such thing as an intrinsically evil desire. Now, no intelligent, end of Rorty, in more than one sense, no intelligent and reflective person who is not no intelligent and steady, steady. No intelligent and reflective person who is not a professional postmodernist academic really believes this. And many academics in the sciences think it as ridiculous as Rorty believed religion to be. In consequence, they take themselves to be justified in rejecting philosophy and theology alike. And not just these, but the other humanities and art subjects also regarding them as at best forms of distracting entertainment. And so they're able to write, as Hawking did, and I quote again, philosophy and natural theology is dead. It's not kept up with, more, kept up with modern developments in science, particularly physics, and scientists have become the bearers of the torch of discovery in our quest for knowledge. Because there's a law of gravity, the universe, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. Now, this is, is as absurd in its way as the nihilism of Rorty. Indeed, if anything, it's worse, since it's literally incoherent. <laughs> nothing, <laughs> nothing can create itself, a fortiori, nothing can create itself ex nihilo. 
In order to create one, first has to exist. The self-serving sensationalism of Rorty and Hawking both result from disconnecting academic research from the higher formation of the young, on the one hand, and from respectful engagement with the non-academic educated public on the other. Currently, many academics and university managers are inclined to blame society for failing to support and respect them. But they've done much themselves to lose the support of society, and they now need to set about regaining it by showing how the university can be a site of formation and reflection, a place committed to educating for wisdom. Thank you very much. If there are any questions or observations, I'm happy to um, happy to uh, receive them. Yes, I'm sorry. Um, I'm Carol Simon. I'm from Hope College, uh, a uh, liberal arts college that um, prides itself on something. I may have to go home and tell them to stop, <laughs> um, which is. Uh, uh, giving students a terrific liberal arts education by engaging them in student faculty research uh, with the idea that research shapes habits of mind and heart that will make them both um, better human beings and more intelligent. And so I'm wondering whether that's a bad idea that we should give up. No, no you're all right, you're all right. But look, to, to resolve this issue, we need to do what the great medieval theologians and philosophers do. We need to draw a distinction. <laughs> it is said in one way that they are engaging in research, but in another way, right? So let me tell you what. Look, the term engaging in research has, a, has acquired a broader currency. So high school pupils could be given a research project, right? That means, the, and the verb to research, I think that's idiomatic in American English, isn't it? Go and research that, which is generally understood as go on Wikipedia, whatever it might be. But anyway, <laughs> but, but I mean, my children at any rate, from probably the ages of 14 or 15 or something, would, would say things like, we're researching a project or something. That means finding out about. No, I'm in a laboratory. Yeah. No, 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 I, of course, no, I didn't, uh, sorry, I wasn't meaning to reduce it to the level of what might go on in high school. What I mean is the, 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 the idiomatic use of research, which has gained currency in education generally, not exclusively in higher education and so on, uh, the, to which I think you're referring is something like this. Engage in a systematic, disciplined project of inquiry with set, certain set aims and using certain disciplined methods and so on and such like. Let's call that inquiry now. Research, in the sense in which Newman was concerned with it, to say that it's no part of the university, or research in the sense in which academics pride themselves in engaging in research, not sharing this with their student friends, but engaging in research, is the acquisition of new knowledge. So the idea is something like this. Not just new to the person, the inquirer, but adding to the stock of human knowledge. Now, I think that, you know, I mean, I've had two children go through programs at Edinburgh University of a sort that part of the undergraduate study involved them in engaging in research. One was an evolutionary biologist and so on. But I, you know, working alongside a group of scientists, let's say, on um, looking at some aspect of, that has a sort of genetic component or something of that sort, is fine. That's part of acquiring things like uh, scientific skills of, of, of you know, disciplined methods, uh, learning the methodology, learning the techniques and things of that sort. That have, has quite properly has a place in, 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 uh, in university studies. What is in question here is the idea of people's conception of what justifies their existence within the academy is they simply engage in the acquisition of new knowledge. Now, so that, that's partly to sort of ease the, 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 the difficulty. Let me say, however, against, against, against what I've said, that one response to what I've said is that this is just self-indulgent at this point. It's simply an indulgence to think 
that there's any turning back of this now, that universities have become places of research in this rather more specific, specified sense. And one of the reasons why it's difficult to think that that could be given up, that we could revert, as it were, to the Mill Newman Ar uh, Arnold conception of higher education, uh, is that first of all, university, universities arguably couldn't survive without engaging in research for the financial rewards that it brings, particularly in terms of government-funded large-scale programs and things of that sort. Uh, but secondly, academics couldn't, uh, I mean, they, they, the conception of themselves that they, and their self-worth that they have developed is such that the idea, you know, that they might somehow be expected to work in, in higher education institutions and not have as their sort of ambition the possibility of being a pure researcher or something of that sort is so anathema to the culture of elite institutions. I mean, I, I, I suppose I have to be slightly careful, particularly if this is being filmed. Yeah, well, perhaps I won't put this. Right, so, uh, but let me, I mean, uh, it is a not uncommon, <laughs> it's a not uncommon feature of universities now uh, to go through a process of looking at candidates for posts in which the thought that this person might be completely hopeless in a classroom isn't even voiced because it's so used to being silenced, you know. Um, the thought that this person would be dysfunctional in terms of their relations with other colleagues or um, wouldn't be willing to engage in administration and so on is not voiced because it's so used to being silenced. The thought is, look, if we could get this person, can you imagine what that would do for our research rating or what that would do for the prestige of our position and so on? That's very, very common. Now, um, the conception there of research has become disconnected from the practice of education. And it is, again, if I could just emphasize, particularly so far as the humanities are concerned, what I was wanting to emphasize, at least part of my argument against, see, one of the arguments for the necessity of research is, you know, research-led teaching, right? That, that uh, the teaching is enriched by research and so on. It seems to be, and I, I'm allowing the case of sciences and these kind of projects and so on, but as far as the humanities in particular are concerned, teaching is enriched by scholarship. It doesn't follow from that it's enriched by research. In fact, my own experience, research-led teaching, I mean, and I do mean, you could just say, well, that just tells you something about your experience, but research-led teaching consists in an academic just talking about what they're currently doing in their research in the presence of a number of students. Mm -hmm. And that's meant to be a privilege for the students <laughs> and a benefit for the uh, academic. Sorry. Mm. I may be next. <laughs> you used a phrase uh, revisiting the idea of making sense in... Oh, yes. Right, this idea that... Uh, if you end up thinking that religion only makes sense in the light of physics, right. uh, then it's time to revisit the idea of the expression making sense. So it occurred to me that that was precisely what these radical evolutionists were asking us to do, right? Mm. That, that they were saying, you haven't really understood Mary's blushing by talking yeah. about her feelings. You've only really understood it when you understand physics or something like this. And it doesn't strike me as obviously absurd. I was. Wondering if you, <laughs> I know it should. I, have, I would feel guilty. I know it should strike me as absurd. But well, I did. The invitation was you might want to think again about the, the, the expression making sense. Well, look, here's one reason why you might think it's absurd. Just try and think of formulating a sentence, right, that begins Mary blushed. Well, that's not merely a physiological description. That doesn't just mean blood. It, the blood flow to her cheeks increased. But blu fl in this context, blushed is a, is a term of psychological description, right? Mary felt embarrassment, right, because, and I'll complete that sentence in the vocabulary of physics. Now, of course, if you say, somebody might say, well, we could do it in the language of physiology, could she blush because, um, you know, the flow of blood to her face or something. But that's take, the, the, the terms of explanation are the wrong sort here, because blush there is just a physiological description, right? Blush in the sense in which we were concerned, looking for an explanation, which is given by seeing John or whoever was as present, it means something like felt embarrassed or you know felt shy or whatever it was. But this only shows, I think, the evolutionist would say that uh, the finitude of human knowledge, right? If we knew more, we could give a description of her emotions purely in terms. I'm channeling. Yeah, you've you also heard the expression "a blank check," haven't you? I mean, this is a, you know, <laughs> the the idea that um, 
you know, if we just, I mean, what, the point here would be, what kind of thing could be added to the stock of knowledge? I mean, by the way, I don't want to, because this would be of interest to philosophers, but I think we might sort of just be indulging ourselves a little bit. I do think it's important to make a distinction here between causes and conditions. And there are lots of conditions that have to be in place for, I mean, of a physical sort and bio, you know, chemical sort and such like. But making sense is meant to be explaining, in a sense of explaining that goes something like, ah, oh, I see why. Right? And now you want to, it, it looks, I mean, just to put it at its briefest, if the thing to be explained is something psychological, the explanation better be psychological. That's right. Yes. Uh, my name is Daniel Ritchie. I teach at uh, Bethel University in St. Paul, Minnesota. And I wonder if you could uh, talk a little bit more about some uh, more positive relationships between science and uh, uh, the humanities or, yes. or theology. Um, and one term I'd like you to speculate on a little bit is the term of beauty, which is something we've heard a little bit about in this conference, but no one has, no one has really discussed wisdom uh, in uh, the appreciation and understanding of, of beauty. It seems like in the sciences, even uh, atheists yes, talk about the experience of majesty, the beauty of information, sure. uh, and the reconciliation of form and matter, and, and so on. Yeah, well, uh, just two things briefly. I mean, one is that the term beauty um, is a sort of analogical term. It's used in different ways of different things. As you say, a beautiful proof, a beautiful scene, a, you know, a beautiful situation, whatever it may be. Um, if one had to say what's common to these uses of the term, one would be reaching out to things like due proportion or fittingness or something of that sort, right? So what's beautiful about this situation is its fittingness, the way in which things are related, parts of whole, and so on. What's beautiful about an argument is, let us say, its economy, for instance, the way in which premise and conclusion are articulated in a very elegant way and things of that sort. So uh, I think that it's certainly what beauty, you know, points towards is order, due proportion, and things of that kind. Now, you might think that that would trigger in the mind of somebody who is disposed to use that language of their subject matter the question, from whence comes this due proportion? And that's an interesting um, case in point. But I, I thought, just to mention, I, I, so I thought possibly we were going somewhere else with this, so let me just say what the other somewhere else is, because it relates to the evolutionary story. So just to give an example, there has been a kind of growth industry I mean, all academia is growth industry now, but there has been a growth industry in evolutionary aesthetics, right? So the idea would be something like this. Why do we enjoy certain sorts of landscapes? Well, because of the conditions under which our ancestors uh, came to be formed. So uh, basically landscapes in which you have an overview of the landscape, but yourself can be concealed, have certain hunting advantages and so on. You can see how this is going to go, right? Um, this is very like Marxist analysis, I mean, to take another age and a different time and place and so on. Marxists would say things like this. Look, if you wonder why, what, why do we think portraiture arose when it did, let us say, in Northern Europe, in a particular form that it did in the 17th century? Well, it's associated with the emergence of a certain kind of mercantile class. And that this is a small class commanding large bodies of wealth over very large numbers of people who could take it away from them overnight. Why didn't they do that? Well, because they created a sense of authority and permanence and presence. And how did they do that? Through the development of portraiture in which the merchant was seen through the portrait. I don't doubt that, that something of that may be true. It's just not going to answer the question, is this painting better than that one? Right? I mean, it sets, in a way, it's back to causes and conditions. Right? I, mean, there are, I, I think Marxist analyses can often be quite illuminating, actually or quasi-Marxist analyses about the economic structures and things of that sort. But they don't fully explain. They set certain conditions. That wasn't your question, but just to make that point. That I think the beauty is, the experience of beauty is an ineliminable form of human experience. It's conditioned and shaped by all sorts of things, including, no doubt, our, our ancestry. But at the end of the day, there is something that is given in the experience of beauty that is not made sense of in terms of all of that. Uh, it's, uh, it's made sense of internally, in its own terms. The only thing that will explain an experience of beauty is an aesthetic explanation. Sorry. Do we have time for one more question? Yeah. Yes, I do, yes. Right. Uh, we'll try and do it in unison, OK? So. Well, OK, sorry. If you make them brief, I'll make them brief. My replies will be, be really briefer, brief. so you get both good in, yes. Um, 
You mentioned that uh, it's unique to have uh, Institute for Faith and Learning, mm. and it's unique to have a conference on on wisdom and on kind of reason, and because of the status of of uh, academy today. So why why is this being done at a Christian university as opposed to other places? And, and you mentioned that. Uh, the, the UK. Thank the Lord or something. You know, would, th <laughs> would thank the Lord be a sufficient answer to that question? <laughs> I'll grace the Holy Spirit. I'll take that. But you, you also mentioned that um, th this kind of thing is not so imaginable in the UK. Or, or no. And I don't know if you have anything to say. Um, the absence of the Holy Spirit from that <laughs> island. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, just, sorry, but just to say, it is a much more degraded culture. British, British culture is degraded in these respects. And not only in these respects, by the way, but it is a degraded <laughs> culture. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, Professor Haldane. <laughs> and I, I just want to ask this. In a world of increasing research, millions of new academic journal articles, 28,000 yeah. academic journals, <laughs> what does good scholarship look like in the midst of that? That was a quick question requiring a quick answer, was it? <laughs> well, I mean, broadly speaking, um, I take, I'm talking about the humanities, because I think the term scholarship is more appropriately related to the question of humanities, which sort of goes back to your question about a use of the term research being appropriate in terms of education, in science teaching and so on. I'm happy to allow that there are differences here. Um, I mean, there can be scholarship in one respect in the sciences, because you might be interested, say, in the history of some aspects of the sciences, but really then you're engaged in a kind of historical project and so on. So I think the task of scholarship, I mean, is to bring things to light in their best form, for example. So that would involve producing critical editions and things of that kind. Um, in the case where translation is at issue, you know, bringing to bear a set of skills, uh, linguistic skills, historical knowledge and so on in order to understand something, right? Not necessarily to produce something new, but to understand the thing that is already there. And that's why progress in the humanities, I, I already have, you know, when somebody talks about progress in the humanities, I'm already kind of slightly feeling a reservation here. But um, because the progress in the humanities is not so much the addition of new knowledge, but understanding the things that in some sense we were already acquainted with. And that's why it is that, for example, somebody who said, look, are you serious about proposing to study Plato in a philosophy class, to teach Plato in a philosophy class, do you know how long he's been dead? I mean, that idea, there is something ridiculous, right. Whereas it does seem to be quite genuinely if somebody says, yeah, I'm doing my, you know, we're doing astrophysics, or what are you, <laughs> what are you thinking of sort of doing? They say, oh, I've got this really quite, interesting 1820 text or something of that sort. Well, it wouldn't be an 1820, but you see what I mean. It is, I mean, there is a sense in which in science teaching the latest is the best, and in science research the latest is the best, right? Because there is a genuine sense of new knowledge here. But in the case of humanities, I think it's a question of understanding. And, and the question is, what is it understanding? Well, it's human life and its products, literature, history, the actions of human beings over time, and so on. Can I just finally say, going back to wherever it was, yes. I mean, I was quite serious about the, that business of the Holy Spirit. I mean, I do think, for example, that it simply isn't an option, or it shouldn't be an option for Christian scholars or Christian teachers or Christian academics more generally to, um, to, to think about the business they're engaged in, either as individuals or as parts of communities and so on, without reference to the Holy Spirit. I mean. If that doesn't feature in their thinking, what do they think they're doing in a Christian institution? Um, and more than that, I think, uh, without <laughs> moving into preaching mode, it's all right, don't worry, it's, nothing, it's not gonna be embarrassing, but I do think that, um, you know, that progression that is taught in scripture, that begins with the Holy Spirit, through whom one comes to Jesus, through whom one comes to the Father, that sense of a kind of progression is relevant to, it seems to be the structuring of understanding. You know, that it's not just, I mean, it's not just a question of invoking the Holy Spirit in aid, as it were. That is itself, we're taught, part and purpose of something else, part and purpose of 
point and part of something else, right? The Holy Spirit is what draws us to the next stage, which draws us to the Father. That's the teaching of Scripture in the Apostolic Church, right? There is this progression through the economy of the divine, from the Spirit to the Son to the Father and so on. Now, it seems to me that that is, obviously those are theological themes, but any scholar, any Christian scholar should be mindful of those ideas. And they, it seems to me they should structure their work in, through prayer. I mean, it's, you know, this is not something that one could say outside of a, a Christian institution without some embarrassment and so on, but the idea that one would begin one's class or work or study, I mean, would have to be prudential about how this is done with prayer, it seems to me, far from being that being an odd idea, I think that Christian institutions would have to find an excuse for why they weren't doing it. Maybe I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> right.